The horror genre is a fantastic, wonderful thing. It opens our eyes and ears to new experiences, introducing us to dangerous worlds from the comfort of our own homes. Yeah, it's got its fair share of cliches, predictability and flat stories, but every now and then a writer, filmmaker or game developer will emerge from their bathroom, pants freshly coated in shit, at the thought of ideas so horrifying, so captivating that they voided their bowels right there and then and thought, I need to share this with the world. However, only so much can be achieved through visual media. Horror movies are great, yeah, for sure, but you as a viewer know you're not in any actual danger. Without interactivity or exploration, you're stuck behind what is essentially a glass wall. This is what makes horror games so much more impactful, at least to me. Being in control of a breathing, thinking personality that reacts to the world they're in and the choices you make is f***ing terrifying. You're not just watching the world move anymore, you're actively a part of it, and it's down to you to face the horrors yourself. True, unhindered terror, however, is difficult for most developers to set up and maintain. Notice I said most, because somewhere out there, there's a group of folks nestled away behind walls of rushing blood and crusted structure gel. A group of unflinching, sadistic creatures who want nothing more than to see you squirm and scream in your seat. And this group is burrowed deep within the heart of some weird foreign country only heard of in legends. I, I think it's called Sweden? Sweden? Norway, that's it. That company is in Norway, and that company is Frictional Games. Welcome to my TED Talk, my name is Raman Lama, and today we'll be delving into just what makes their game so wonderfully, disgustingly, and beautifully horrifying. Frictional Games have made a name for themselves since their founding in late 2006, early 2007. Their games such as the Penumbra series, Amnesia the Dark Descent and Soma are infamous for their intense atmospheres, incredible world building and of course, their breathtaking stealth horror. In each of them you play as a mostly defenseless protagonist who finds themselves in increasingly hostile situations. But while they're all set in different time periods, they all share similar structure, gameplay and ideals. However, once you begin to break down the way the game is presented, you start to understand just how the game crawls into your head and how it stays there so effectively. They achieve this with a specific formula. I call it the Frictional Games Formula. Roll credits! No. Frictional typical approach to their games can be sliced into three different categories. World, Immersion, and Consequence. These three categories play an essential role in the Frictional Formula, and are the cornerstones to delivering an intense and memorable experience to the player. It's helpful too that all three of these fundamentals fall under their own common driving force. Fear is such an individual and specific emotion, but the one thing that we're all undeniably unsettled by is the unknown. Darkness. Death. Decay. But, before we start discussing world immersion and consequence however, we need to go over one thing. Everything you come across, every room you walk into, everything you see, has a purpose. These motherfuckers know what they're doing, and I can assure you that every single sound, colour, building, creature, character, mechanic, art asset, song, level, note and item has been sadistically handcrafted to intimidate you, to question you, to stare at you while you sleep, to breathe down your neck, to pin you to the floor, scratch into your soul and laugh at you as you whimper and cry and struggle and beg and bleed and scream as this beast's nails rip deep into your skin, carve out your heart and eat it in front of you like a fucking casserole. Like a fucking casserole, Sean. <sighs> okay, we good? We all caught up now? Yeah? <sighs> Alright, sweet. Without any further ado, let's take a dive into the Frictional Games formula. Each game starts off slow, letting you become accustomed to your character's various movement speeds, weight and starting area. You settle yourself in and begin to make your way through the level. Frictional do this because they understand it's important for the player to move at their own pace and be comfortable within the scene. It's key to the player's immersion that the introductory experience is natural and uncluttered. We'll talk more about immersion later. For now, let's start discussing the environments of the games and how they alter as you progress through them. In Penumbra Overture, you play as a man named Philip on a journey to find your supposedly dead father. You start out in a lovely little cabin on a boat headed to Greenland. The sun beams through the windows, the air is crisp and the room is warm and well kept. You stay there for a brief period of time, exploring it and getting your bearings. Everything is grounded and calm. It's safe 
and you enjoy being there. After that, you're thrown into the cold, uncaring outdoors, your character on the verge of literally freezing to death if you don't shift your ass and get him somewhere warm. You follow the narrow, restrictive path in front of you, solve a quick physics puzzle, and before you know it, you fall down a fucking hole and die. You then wake up in a mine buried beneath the surface. You get to your feet, find a light source, and you're left on your own. It's now up to you to discover where you are and what move to make next. As you make your way through the game, the labyrinthine mine turns into an office space, construction zone, research station, and laboratory. The levels become darker, and you start to realise that something else is in the mines with you, hunting you. And if you don't act, then you'll end up as a fucking Philip Pancake. A threat lurks around every corner. Also, there's a giant worm. You start noticing the deeper you go, the more dilapidated the areas become. But it's not just the environment that's slowly decaying, the player's sanity is too. You become more hesitant. You notice sounds you didn't hear before. You begin to scare yourself, even when you're safe. You buckle down and pull through, but then you see it. A figure, standing far away in the distance, staring at you. Is this person friendly? Is this person hurt? Are they even a person? Fuck. I, I guess I have to go- Ah, fuck! <laughs> Penumbra Black Plague starts with Philip waking up in an unfamiliar room. The air smells clinical and metallic. The ceiling is hanging down over you and the walls bleed with a rot. You set out to find yourself trapped even deeper in the facility, with even worse horrors skulking around. A hive mind of intelligent humanoid creatures have made their home here, and it falls onto you to find the truth about your father and get out. It's not going to be easy, however. You become infected, and the consciousness of someone else becomes trapped inside your head. They warp your view of reality, distorting your vision and making you hallucinate. This entity is a threat, and if you don't act, then Philip will die. You start noticing the deeper you go, the more dilapidated the areas become. But it's not just the environment that's slowly decaying, the player's sanity is too. You become more hesitant. You notice sounds you didn't hear before. You begin to scare yourself even when you're safe. You buckle down and pull through, but then you see it. A figure approaching you. It lets you peek behind the curtains and see into its slowly dying world. Whether or not you're safe is up for debate. All you know is that you know nothing. Penumbra Requiem exists. I love this game! Amnesia the Dark Descent starts you off as a man named Daniel, lost in Castle Brennenberg with no memories as to how you got there. You climb to your feet and head off to discover where you are and why you're here. Rain beats down against the windows as you walk along the carpeted ground. Daniel's mind screams and his intense fear of the dark plagues you throughout the entirety of the game. You pick up a lantern, your best friend and find out that you gave yourself amnesia to forget all traces of what happened at the castle. Your only goal now is to find and kill a man named Alexander. As you go from room to room, you find notes your past self has left for you, and you begin to slowly piece together the story entry by entry. However, you also notice that something else is lurking in the castle with you. You hear footsteps on the ground above you, a distant clattering of glass, a child's cry, a wailing demon. You're not alone, you're not safe. You need to get away. You need to run. You need to hide. If you stop moving, you are going to die. Close the door. Barricade yourself in. If you let it get to you, you'll- You start noticing the deeper you go, the more dilapidated the areas become. But it's not just the environment that's slowly decaying. The player's sanity is too. You become more hesitant. You notice sounds you didn't hear before. You begin to scare yourself even when you're safe. You buckle down and pull through, but then you see him. Alexander. It's time to end this. What will you do? Soma puts you in the shoes of Simon Jarrett, a man who has a terminal illness and is attending an experimental brain scan to seek appropriate treatment. Soma also puts you in the shoes of Imogen Reed, a dead woman carrying the consciousness of Simon Jarrett. Soma also puts you in the shoes of Rally Herber, a dead woman also carrying the consciousness of Simon Jarrett. Soma also puts you in the shoes of Simon Jarrett. You wake up in Pathos 2, 
an underwater research facility haunted by the depressing past of its staff and crew. You explore the station on a mission to find out where you are and what happened to the world. Before long, you meet a woman called Catherine, except she's not a woman, she's an AI of the human consciousness she used to be, preserved inside a robot. But if she's not human, how is she sentient? How is she talking and remembering and feeling and thinking and experiencing? Well, at least I'm not a robot. <laughs> oh, that'd be fucked, wouldn't it? Wait, I'm a robot? But, uh, but I'm Simon? What? What? But, but I'm Simon. Understandably confused, you make your way further into Pathos 2. You start noticing the deeper you go, the more dilapidated the areas become. But it's not just the environment that's slowly decaying, the player's sanity is too. You become more hesitant, you notice sounds you didn't hear before. You begin to scare yourself even when you're safe. You buckle down and pull through. You've gone through so much and it's all about to pay off. It's a shame not all stories can have happy endings. All of these worlds are vastly different to each other, each with their own characters and landmarks and dates of importance. The common theme they all share is that the further you progress, the more you learn about the world and the darker that world becomes. Characters become skeptical or angry, environments fall into disrepair and you're ultimately left questioning if what you're doing is right, let alone if you're actually doing anything at all. Everything is tied down to one word, decay. Each of Frictional's worlds are so intricate, so detailed and so filled with symbolism and beauty, but level by level that beauty gets snuffed out. It dies. The universe doesn't care about you. Everything has its time and everything dies. But it's up to you, the player, in those fleeting moments, to decide whether or not you're gonna die today. You better get moving. Now, immersion is a term you've definitely heard thrown around a lot when it comes to anything frictional related. The team crafts their games around the goal of hooking you in and keeping you invested in the world, and that's an approach to their art that they've always stayed true to since their very first work. Frictional don't just want to make you panic though, they want to show you some beautiful worlds, some new points of view, they want to challenge you and they want you to challenge yourself. They build their worlds for you to lose yourself in, to make you feel like you're a part of something greater. Yeah, it heightens the scares when you're so invested that you physically can't bring yourself to leave your hiding spot in fear of being killed or worse. But it makes you appreciate the world you're playing in. Your actions have consequences. They might not be immediate sometimes, but everything you do has a purpose and tells you something about yourself that you might not have known. An immersion in a frictional game is achieved so simply. You're not held back. Let's go over why immersion is so brilliant in these games, starting with the areas we go to. There are next to no invisible walls in a frictional game. Some levels are more linear than others for sure, yeah, but every environment is created with player movement in mind. The maze of caves in Penumbra aren't left as gaping black holes that Philip can't pass through. The dungeons in Amnesia aren't never-ending passages that tease other rooms in the distance. The ocean floor of Pathos 2 has its own nooks and crannies just begging to be explored. You can go wherever you want to. You can run around the same level 20 times, go for it. You want to go from level to level walking around picking up whatever items you please? Be our guest, Frictional says. You want to spam the jump button to leave the map boundaries on the ocean floor? Actually, maybe don't do that. But you can if you want to. That's the beauty of it. And items! You can pick up whatever the f*** you like! You want to read the title of that book on the floor? Bring it closer, turn it around, get the dust off it. Pick up boxes and throw them at enemies to slow them down. I wouldn't recommend it, but I mean, you can. You can ram a fire extinguisher into Robo Catherine's stupid little body 7,000 times, we'll let you. Frictional don't care. You want to throw shit at windows? Go for it, mate. You have the freedom to explore, maneuver, and experience the world at your own place whenever and wherever you want to. You become so immersed and attached in these worlds that you don't think about the controls anymore, it just becomes second nature. There are no HUDs, no health meters, no quest markers, there's nothing except you and the game. And that's why these games pull off fear that other horror games can't. You truly feel a part of the world you're in. What you do and how you behave matters, and it's when you feel like you're in the game itself is when you're most vulnerable. However, immersion only works if you're in a convincing world, and you can't live in a world if your actions don't carry weight. Which brings us on to our next part of the frictional formula. 
You leave dust in the ocean when you walk. You hurt yourself when you fall from great heights. When you make noise, creatures can hear you. When you kill people... They feel it. You feel it. The world feels it. The world remembers everything you do and you cannot feel like you're making important decisions without seeing outcomes of those decisions. To escape the Turngate in Penumbra, you kill them. To lower the water level to access the sewers in Amnesia, you drown someone. To save what's left of mankind, it falls to you to put those in need out of their misery. Would you stay with me, please? Your choices leave marks on the world. You affect how other creatures think and behave towards you. You cannot have immersion without knowing what you're doing is changing something, and you can't have things to change if you don't have a convincing world. These three factors are so dependent on each other, and it's an incredibly difficult balance to maintain for such a long period of time. And while it's never perfect, Frictional have cut it fucking close, and they're only going to improve more and more with each world they bring to life. Which, when you think about it, means that whatever Frictional have up their sleeves next, it's only going to be more terrifying and immersive than ever before, and I cannot fucking wait to see it. Now, obviously, I'm not a game developer. What I've mentioned today are not explicit principles that Frictional follow. I'm sure they have their own traditions, foundations, and applications for the work that they do. For me personally, I love these games. I love dissecting them and learning what makes them tick. The psychology behind human emotions is extremely complex and difficult to summarise, but it's so fulfilling to learn why these games scare me and millions of other people. There's an incredible amount of work that goes into making a game, but it's wonderful, fucking wonderful, to see consistent and sustained growth from a company that didn't start with much. They're not a large company at all by today's standards, especially when you compare them to other gaming companies, but Frictional has grown an incredible amount since its conception. They didn't have an office like they do now. They didn't have job openings, and they didn't have much of an online presence like they've got currently. Frictional Games single-handedly revolutionised the horror industry, and by extent the gaming industry. If anything, their success ultimately hinders them in their future actually, because now people have these expectations of horror and storytelling that can be overwhelming and intimidating as a developer to look to. But they're one of the few companies I trust now. In gaming, we've seen so many stabs to the back by companies we thought we could trust. I know Frictional won't let me down, and I'll fully support them in whatever they want to create next. Anyway, that was the Frictional Games formula. Build an incredible story, let the players settle in, foreshadow future events, and slowly show them the fucked up world waiting for them. I know this video will be seen by the majority of the company as well, so I just want to say a few things. Hello! Number one, I'm sorry this video was so fucking long, but I hope you enjoyed it. If I went into any more depth, this video would have easily been hours long, so... Just know that I'm going to work on more videos for you to enjoy and for the community to enjoy as well. I absolutely love doing stuff like this. And Tom, I still have your interview answers. I remember I was going to interview you like two years ago now for a college project. And I've been out of college for two years now. Oops. <laughs> I'm sorry I left you hanging. I'm sorry I left Miko hanging as well in email two years ago. I'll follow up with both of you soon. I promise it's just been really couple... It's been really busy. <laughs> Number two, you have an amazing team full of brilliant potential. It's absolutely incredible to have seen your company grow and flourish over the years, and it's wonderful to be a part of the community now. I'm so proud of each and every one of you for your dedication and commitment over the years, and all I can say is I hope you're doing what you love every single day. You've inspired me and so many other people, and will forever be grateful for the work you've done. And number three, you'd better get used to hearing my dumbass voice, because I've got a hell of a lot more videos coming down the pipeline. I cannot wait to see what you beautiful fuckers will create next. I can't wait to speculate, hypothesize, discuss, and experience with you and the rest of the community. You've made some amazing things, all of you, and I hope every concept artist, programmer, voice actor, level designer, sound designer, music producer, and everything in between has a fantastic day. <laughs>